Thank you. Go Thank for you. it. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Teleshadowing. Today we have Dr. Green with us for Teleshadowing's third anniversary. So this is Dr. Green's fourth annual Teleshadowing session. So I want to thank him for joining us this morning to share his knowledge and experience with us. So I'll go ahead and introduce him now. Dr. John Green received his medical degree from the University of South Florida College of Medicine in Tampa, Florida, and completed his internal medicine residency and infectious diseases fellowship at the University of South Florida. Dr. Green is a professor of medicine and currently is the section chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases and Tropical Medicine medicine. He is also a senior member of the internal medicine department at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa. Dr. Green is affiliated with numerous committees, community outreach projects, associations, and boards. He is an accomplished speaker and writer, having published over 230 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals, published over 153 abstracts, and has been a speaker for over 176 invited presentations. He has written and published two books and written over 31 chapters in other books. Dr. Green's research interest is prevention and management of infectious complications in neutropenic patients with a hematologic malignancy. In addition, he has an interest in the diagnosis and management of pulmonary non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. Dr. Green er earned multiple awards, including the Outstanding Resident Teaching Award in Internal Medicine from, from USF, um, the Outstanding Teacher of the Year Award by the American College of Physicians, and selected by his peers in Best Doctors of America in 2012. Dr. Green has been a mentor to hundreds of medical students throughout his career and has taken many students with him on his yearly medical mission trips to third world countries. So now I'd like to request Dr. Green to begin today's session. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Amna, and thank you uh, for your mother, Asima, for allowing me to talk to your group here. I'm going to tell you briefly about my own medical career and why I'm interested in global medicine, international medicine with a specific interest in parasites. And so <clears throat> I grew up in Miami, which looks like this from an overhead shot. Uh, spent lots of times on the beaches of Miami. Enjoyed uh, the Biscayne Bay area with their clear water. Enjoyed the Everglades right out the, the back door headed towards the west. And I went to school at uh, Hialeah Miami Lakes, played four years of football and got a scholarship to go to William and Mary and play football and to um, finish my college degree of pre-med in Williamsburg, Virginia. And it's the oldest uh, college after Harvard with people like uh, Thomas Jefferson going there. And this is what the campus looks like. I then wound up at uh, USF in Moffitt, which initially looked like this, and the med school was in the back before moving to downtown, which is now in the area of downtown Tampa, as you can see there. Uh, and I still stay 20 minutes north at Moffitt Cancer Center, which continues to grow. And my special interest is infections and in leukemia cancer patients. And now to talk to you about parasites. Uh, whenever somebody thinks they have a parasite, especially if they have a medical background, there's a 99.9% .9 chance they don't have a parasite. They just think they do. And these are all the times when parasites are thought to be there, but they are mistaken. And this is what it looks like when you think you look in the stool and your toilet and you see things moving and they look like a worm, they're actually not a worm. They're actually broccoli sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, and other dishes that you may have eaten, and it does not get digested through your GI tract, and by taking up water, it can, in the toilet bowl, move and actually think there's a worm in your intestine. Also, if you look under the microscope, lots of things under the microscope from your stools look like a parasite, but they're actually not. You can have all kinds of things in your stools from pollen to um, red cells to mushroom spores and other plant elements and even algae. Here's some examples of uh, root hair that could be confused as a parasite under the microscope and even pollen grains. In fact, people who are really deluded and think they have parasites will bring in 
all kinds of specimens saying, look, this is a parasite and all it is is colon mucus and hair and skin fibers and carpet fibers. So a lot of people suffer from delusions of parasitosis. In fact, in the United Kingdom, they looked at all the specimens were thought to be parasites and guess what they found under the microscope? Skin flakes, mucus, hair, debris, nails, synthetic carpet fibers, plant materials, insects, all kinds of things that are not parasites in humans. Now, the eggs of parasites can vary from very small 30 microns to very large 150 microns. And these are the different eggs. And it's pretty neat to try to uh, look at a egg and find out which one it is based on its shape and size. So when you think of parasites, you got three major categories. Flatworms, cestodes, those are the tapeworms, the trematodes, which are the flukes, and the nematodes, which can be broken down into tissue and intestine. So this is what they look like, cestodes, trematodes, nematodes. So let's talk about the soil worms called geohelminths, the big four listed there. Here's where they're going to be in very high concentration in red. Yes, we still have them in the U.S. The first one causes rectal prolapse, and the worm is the white on the rectal background, and it makes a collagenase to make the rectum basically lose its collagen fiber, and then it prolapses out when you go to the bathroom. The worm is actually on the surface, and they call that the coconut cake presentation because it looks like coconut on a cake. It's actually the whipworm, which is called Trichurus trichuria, and you can tell why they call it the whipworm because the worm looks like a whip, and the eggs are on the right and have a, a percolated end with these little plugs, and they look like a football. And this is pretty cool looking when you look under the microscope. This is an intestine full of whipworms, and there they are on the intestine and on a barium enema. There it is under the microscope, the male and the female whipworm. This is a nematode. The barium in them on the right, you can see how small these things are. Here's the coconut cake prolapse that we talked about. And, and that's pretty pathognomonic for this. This is a lot of whipworms in somebody's intestine. There it is under the microscope if you like to see it in more detail. And as I said, it's very high throughout the world and some of the rural areas along the Appalachian Mountains in Louisiana may have more whipworm than other places. So this is the summary of the size and also often you're co-infected with other things called ascaris. If you eat the dirt or soil, which uh, pregnant women do, people in rural areas eat dirt, okay? You can eat the organism, or you could be eating vegetables, then you didn't wash the dirt off them very well, and you can get this uh, worm potentially if it's in the soil. The second worm causes itching in your anal area. We call that perianal paritis, and it comes out at night. So what you do, it's usually in kids, is it sounds gross, but you get a flashlight at night, your kid's rear end is uh, itching, you get a scotch tape and you look with a flashlight at their anal area, looks like this. And when you see these white little specks, you get the scotch tape and touch it to the anus and it picks up the eggs and the worms and then they can identify the patient as having pinworms, enterobius vermicularis, and it lives in your colon and sheds its eggs at the anal area. And this is what it would look like under the microscope. The right lower corner is the kid itching their rear end because the worms are in the anal area. And there's the worm when you scope them. It's tiny. There it is in the bottom, the anal area. And then it has these two little alar lateral under the microscope when you cut it in half. And there's the eggs and the ala. 
And there it is, very close up, an interesting looking worm, pinworms. They look like a pin. Their eggs are flat on one side. And this is the scotch tape that you would have brought in. And we look and it's full of eggs. And now we know this person has pinworm. So pinworm um, is uh, not that big. It can cause problems sleeping. And girls, it can move up to the vaginal area and start itching in the vaginal area. And when kids sleep in the same bed, they can auto-infect each other. And so the scotch tape test at night, and you can treat it with mabendazole or albendazole. It's called enterobius vermicularis, and it's called the pinworm. And everything I said is summarized in this here. The next worm causes bowel obstruction because it's as big. These things, by the way, are only like, you know, a centimeter long or a few millimeters. That's not a lot. This thing is as big as an earthworm. You've seen earthworms before. This thing can get um, into a big ball and obstruct your intestine. And this is what it would look like. Here's the egg. It looks like a hand grenade with a bubble kind of surface. And here's a kid who's full of ascaris with a big belly. And then when you give them a medicine to kill it or get it out of the intestine, you may actually have the kid pass a giant worm bolus. If the kid can't pass the worm bolus, then you have to operate. And then in the adult human, the worm likes to travel to your bile system where your liver gallbladder is. So you get your scope, you see the thing coming out of the bile duct, you grab it and pull it out. And that's what it looks like. Here it is in the appendix that caused obstruction of the appendix with appendicitis. Here it is in your intestine. Uh, the nematodes eat, um, some, some of them like Ascaris eat your stool. So when you swallow barium, the worm is swallowing the barium white. So you can see with a red arrow, the worm is actually in its intestine, has a line, and that is Ascaris. You can see it all over the intestine. And then here it is in the bile duct, obstructing the bile system on the right. On the left, the worm is in your lower esophagus. It has been known to crawl out of your mouth and nose, which is quite gross. Uh, here it is in your intestine, eating the barium. And here is the uh, whirlpool sign with a big ball of worms in the left lower field showing a big ball like a whirlpool. The worms can actually be visualized in different positions, resting, advancing, and drifting. This kid had to have surgery, had his stomach opened up, and all the worms were pulled out of his intestine to the left. As I said, it can come out your nose and your mouth when you're real sick, as I mentioned. Here it is in the esophagus trying to come out your mouth, the white, the black line in the white background. This family, uh, this couple went to Africa and gave everybody in the village worm medicine and somehow screened their stools and found um, a large, gigantic pile of worms of Ascaris that they had dewormed the village. This is the egg, as I said. It looks like a hand grenade with a bubbled surface. The actual cutting the worm in half looks pretty interesting. It has a propeller uh, look to it on the right in the middle where the intestine is. And there's the worm, looks like an earthworm, and you eat it and it gets in your intestine by eating uh, unwashed vegetables, putting dirty hands in your mouth. So therefore, kids more than adults do that. If it goes through your lungs, it can cause eosinophilia and pneumonia. And Ascaris is actually quite common, a billion infections in the world, and it can cause bowel obstructions and abscesses and problems, as we mentioned. And uh, when it goes through the lungs, we call it Leffler syndrome. Now, the hookworms are small. They're only a quarter of a millimeter long, so very tiny. And they suck 0.1 cc of blood per day. And if you have a thousand of them, you become anemic. 
as they're sucking your blood. They have what looks to be teeth at their mouth. And this is one of them that doesn't have the teeth look to it, Nicator. The ancyclostoma has more of a teeth look to it. Here it is attached to your mucosa. And then on the right, it's sucking the red blood cells. And when it stops and there's no more blood to suck, it lets go and catches on to another location. And this is what kids look like in the days of the Inca and Aztecs to the left. And here's what they look like today in modern days with the big belly and the malnutrition. And then this is the egg. It's not as thick as the Ascaris, but it's about the same size. You can see that in the stool. So hookworms, they like sandy, shady kind of sand. And unlike putting dirt in your mouth on vegetables or your fingers, this one actually drills through your skin, walking barefooted, playing in the dirt, digging in the dirt without protection. And then when the dog and cat and the raccoon and other animals, hookworms, drill into your skin from you walking at the beach barefooted or anywhere else in sand or dirt, the thing uh, will migrate in the skin. It cannot get into your internal body. So it moves in the skin, itches like crazy. And it looks like a zigzag pattern. And we call that the creeping eruption or cutaneous larva migraines, especially your feet, because you're walking with your flip-flops or barefooted. And there it is creeping along the skin over several weeks. There it is again, creeping eruption, cutaneous larva migraine. It has a snake or serpiginous track. Here it is in the bottom of the foot. We went to a mission trip to Amazon and saw this guy with itching on his arm and side. He said he slept on top of a sand pile because it was cool. But of course, animals, wild animals, cats, dogs defecate in sand and it's full of worms. So in the United States, if you get these worms in Florida, you'll only have about six or eight of them at any one time. If you get them in South America, like this guy in Brazil, the average number is two to 400. So they eventually die and you'll be itching for a month. And if I give you ivermectin, we can kill them faster, but you can't cut them out. You just let them die and your immune system clears them out. So remember the cutaneous larva migraines, ivermectin, albendazole. And you can get this in Florida, by the way, at the beach. That's why dogs aren't allowed on the beach. They defecate. Of course, raccoons defecate in the sand. Um, and then you can, um, wherever dogs are sleeping or staying outside, you can get it. Uh, Flip-flops, of course, aren't going to protect you because you get your feet in the sand. And this is what the cutaneous larva migraines looks like. And that is the egg. Now, the big granddaddy of them all, hookworm that makes it on every test, is this one. Because most hookworms, uh, which I've had in my life growing up as a kid in Miami, digging in the dirt, playing in the dirt, my arms would itch. And I didn't know why. Now I do. Um, but this one actually gets in your intestine. And um, it can stay there your entire life. And then when you're old and you get steroids, chemo for cancer or whatever, it can migrate out of your intestine, take the intestinal bacteria E. coli into your blood, making you very sick. And it can migrate through your lungs, giving you this pneumonia pattern. And the key to this story is that you have E. coli in your blood, you have HIV or some other disease that causes immune suppression and somebody is supposed to know in the world of medicine to check your spit for a ova and parasite test to look for the worm uh, and then you find it okay that's always on the boards it mimics a run-of-the-mill e coli bacteria infection in the blood and the pneumonia and the next step is the whole cause is the strongyloides is all over your body hyperinfection 
because you're immune suppressed and it's been sitting decades dormant doing nothing in your intestine and now it takes off grows and as it moves from stool to bloodstream it takes the e coli on its back and puts it into your blood making you very sick and this is what your spit would look like under the microscope with a special ova parasite stain with the one quarter of a millimeter long strongyloides. Here it is crawling all over the auger plate, looking like pearl necklaces, carrying the normal oral flora with it, which are the tiny white colonies. But the movement of the worm is making those weird shapes like zigzags. Now, when the strongyloides migrates, it does it in a straight line. And we have a special name for that rash called larva curans. And this is what it looks like. And if you look under the microscope, strongyloides is unique because it has a slit tail or a notch. And this is what it looks like in your skin. By the way, this the skin rash can creep at 5 to 15 centimeters per hour, which is quite fast. And usually you're on steroids or you have a cancer or you have HIV, something immune suppressant lets it take off and we treat it with ivermectin. And this is what it looks like under the microscope. And it's a quarter of a millimeter long. And there's the notch tail. And there's the auger plate crawling all over it. And remember, you can only see this with a microscope, quarter of a millimeter long. And the eggs, the different shapes that we went over, the big four, just to remind you how they look a little different. Now, let's go to the tissue nematodes. So now you shoot and kill a wild animal. You hang up the meat like beef jerky, and you didn't cook it. It could be a pig, a hog a cougar, a walrus, a whale, you name it, any animal in the wild. And now the worm is in the muscles that move your eye, giving you your eyes protruding called exophthalmos. Your conjunctiva is injected called chemosis. And your muscles ache. Your nails have little black spots that look like splinter hemorrhages. The, the tissue around your eyes are swelling and your eosinophils are elevated. So I biopsy your muscle and there's the worm. I wonder what it is. It's called trichinosis, trichinella spirella, and there it is in your muscle. You ate it, it went through your bloodstream and landed in your muscles. And that's the cyst in your muscle. Here you are eating the pig and it wasn't adequately cooked or any other animal, whether it's a bear, a cougar, you name it, you can get it, a whale, but pigs are the most common ones. Any of these animals can give you trichinosis. Now, buying it in the store, you won't get it because they don't accept it, but any wild animal could give you trichinosis and it has to be cooked to adequately get rid of it. And if it goes to your heart, you get myocarditis. It goes to your brain, you get encephalitis. And if you're really deathly ill, you may need steroids. Now, the next uh, tissue worm. Some people claim that Escalapes, the god of medicine, has this stick with a snake around it. And they want to say that the guinea worm looks just like that symbol. And they think it came from that. But I don't think so. But it, it does have relevance for the stick and the snake looking uh, as a worm. You'll see what I mean in just a minute. Okay, so here's a neat worm that the World Health Organization is trying to eradicate. How do you get it? You get it by drinking contaminated water, which has a copepod, which has, you can't see this copepod, by the way, it's microscopic. Animals eat, drink the water in the a field, and then it goes through your intestine to your legs. It's a worm about a foot long, it lives in your lymphatics. When you put your foot into water, it knows that there's water and it wants to complete its life cycle. So it makes enzymes to put its tail out to lay millions of eggs to infect more copepods. The problem is it's causing ulcers in your legs and pain. And then how do you stop this from happening? 
and eradicate it. You tell people like the kid in the left side, don't drink water from a large surface area. You'll drink the copepods and get it. And if we can give you a well called a borehole well and keep it covered, we can keep any copepods out of it so you won't catch this worm. We call it the thread worm. And um, here it is. You have to pull it out one inch per day, and it takes you a month to pull it out or several weeks. You can use a match stick, and when it sticks its tail out, you grab it, put it on a stick, and pull one inch per day until the whole thing comes out. And then to get it to come out through that one on the right or the upper left, what you want to do is um, put your foot in a bucket of water for 30 minutes. It'll stick the tail out and then grab it. And when you grab it, then you can roll it on a stick. Sometimes it can be quite painful. It's the guinea worm. The guinea worm, the thread worm. Looks like a thread, doesn't it? Here it is pulling that thing out. All right. This guy had an ingenious idea. He actually got a string and tied the tail, and that way he can pull it an inch a day. You don't want it to break off by pulling it too strongly, or you'll get abscesses up your leg. And so there's the copepod. The bug is called Dracunculus metanensis. There it is where it lands in other parts of your body and dies. The one on the foot, it's between your foot bones. It's in your leg and your lymphatics. It's in your pelvis in the left upper. It even migrated to your upper shoulder neck area and it calcified and died. And there it is in your right upper abdomen on the far left, the patient's right. That's um, the Dracunculus medianensis is found in the countries in red and they're certifying eradication soon. But because there's dogs have it, It'll be hard to eradicate because it's not just in humans. So summarizing Dracunculus medianensis, the guinea worm. Here's another worm. This causes elephantiasis, lymphatic filaria. It's a tissue nematode. It can be spread by mosquito bites. If you get bad enough to get elephantiasis, you have to have hundreds of mosquito bites over a long period of time. You don't just travel there, get some mosquito bites, and get sick from this. You have to stay there a while. And this is where filaria lymphatic filariasis is located in the world. Here's a clinic in India with people having elephantiasis, a big leg, or other parts of your body, like your scrotum. And here's a kid with elephantiasis of the scrotum, a hydrocele. And because it's blocking lymphatics, you, you you urinate white urine, which is called chyluria. It's your lymphatic fluid is white. And that's what it looks like, urinating white. This is the pictures of elephantiasis. It obstructs your lymphatics of the scrotum, the legs. The scrotums can sometimes get quite large from the filaria. And the largest one ever recorded was this one. And it was cut off and then put into a museum. And that's the scrotum of this guy in a museum from elephantiasis. Again, there's the scrotum, the hydrocele's, and the whole area gets really big from blockage of fluid. This is in Dominican Republic with elephantiasis. And uh, there's a case, and the treatment is ivermectin. This is in Haiti, elephantiasis, mosquito bites spreading this. And you can see the elephantiasis. Uh, and then this is the worms in the lymphatics dancing under ultrasound in their eggs. And then you get secondary strep infection, which turn red and hot. And then over time, your skin gets really thick. And it looks like a cauliflower. We call that barukai. And there's um, it getting very thick skin, really uh, thick skin, the, the epidermis. 
Now, there are actually surgeries to get rid of this edema. You got to cut all this sub-Q tissue off, Thompson operation, the Charles operation, and then you put uh, skin grafts, and it looks like that when you're done. And then don't forget the Kyle urea obstructing the uh, lymphatics going to your kidneys and your ureters and bladder. Now, here's something really cool and interesting. These filaria have evolved to have a bacteria called Wolbachia eventually lives, excuse me, in the worm of Wuchraria, which is the filaria, and it's a bacteria, it's not a worm. And it becomes like its energy source, like a mitochondria. And now these two have evolved to live together. And the interesting thing is if you give doxycycline an antibiotic, which doesn't kill worms, but kills bacteria such as Wolbachia, if you kill Wolbachia, you will kill the worm. So that's pretty cool that killing the Wolbachia with doxycycline kills the Wuchraria, the filaria. So isn't that interesting? And Wolbachia, if you Google it, is a real interesting bug because they are inserting it into mosquitoes, releasing them in South Florida to make sterile males who mate with females and no eggs are produced. And the idea is to get rid of mosquito-borne vectors and diseases like dengue and Zika and chikungunya and all that that's in the Caribbean, Central South America, and making it to South Florida. So, Wolbachia has many roles besides worms, so check that out. It's an interesting story. So, that's the story of the endosymbiotic relationship of the bacteria Wolbachia and these um, filaria tissue nematodes called Wuchraria brugia oncocerca. So, that's what a filaria would look like with a sheath on it and nuclei. You diagnose it by um, looking for the worm in your blood at night because it migrates at night. And you can diagnose different types of filaria. Brugia timori, named after the Timor Islands. Wolbachia with the Wuchraria inside of it. Or excuse me, yes, with the Brugia malaya as the, as the worm and the bacteria is Wolbachia. And how do you get it? A mosquito bite, so you can see the mosquito, and that is good old Culex mosquito, and that's the worms in its proboscis. And where do you see it mostly? In those countries across the equator. And there's the Brugia malaya. Here's the elephantiasis of Brugia malaya. And then the obstruction of the lymphatics are causing all of this. And then something that mimics. This is a neat idea and thought. You could actually have a disease that is not a parasite, but it looks just like it. And it's due to you walking barefooted or working in rural areas in a volcanic soil country. And the silica and the sandy soil gets into your tissues and then in lymphatics and obstructs it. So this has got a special name to it. And it looks just like the parasite uh, of elephantiasis, but it's not. It's silica, and it's preventable, and it's found in all these countries that have volcanic soil. It's actually called podoconiosis. How do you think you would present it? Prevent it? Well, you prevent it by telling people and helping them wear shoes and don't walk barefooted. So this is 100% preventable podoconiosis. So the World Health Organization combines lymphatic filaria and podoconiosis together to try to eliminate it because it's in the same location in the world. So that's what global elimination would look like. These are the filaria in the peripheral bloodstream. And there's the Lincoln logs or the long logs in the tail under high power identifying this one as Loa Loa. Now, some of these filaria can migrate across the conjunctiva of your eye, and that's what it would look like. And if you extract it by making an excision, that's what the worm looks like on your in your 
conjunctiva of your eye. And then here it is migrating across the, the outer parts of your orbit cheek, giving you this intermittent swelling across your bones of your cheek, the bones of your hand, your wrist. You get collabar swelling, and it looks like that for a few days. And the worm is migrating across those areas through your tissue. And, and sometimes it dies and calcifies, and we can see it between your uh, bones of your hand. Now, one of these filaria is spread by something that looks like a horse fly, but we call it a mango fly. You can get itching when it worm moves across your tissues, and then in the eye extraction, loa loa. And that's the fly that um, bites you and inserts the loa loa into you. That fly is located in sub-Saharan Africa, along with um, the fly that spreads onchocerciasis, which causes river blindness, which we will tell you about. So loa loa, easy to remember, two O's, two I's, the African eye worm. Here's the pathophysiology of river blindness, the Simulian black fly, only can breed and lay eggs and larvae near rapidly moving water. So people who live near rivers with rapid water become blind because of this worm affecting their eyes. It's the second leading cause of blindness worldwide due to an infection with trachoma being number one. This is loa loa moving across your eye. That's different than onchocerciasis, but they're all the filaria. Here's a big worm nodule bolus in your sub-Q tissue. Here it is in your scalp or resecting it from any possible location. A big nodule full of worms that look like that. And under the microscope, if you scrape the skin, you might see them. Your skin um, becomes very saggy, like an elephant, elephant skin. And it starts wrinkling because it makes a collagenase. It can form boluses of worms on your bony prominences. It can move across your arms to give you collabar swelling. It can give you the hanging groin syndrome where it causes bags of worms in your groin. Now, if you cut this open, there's a ton of worms at the bottom. And because it's making collagenase, your tissue is wrinkled. That's true worm hanging groin. If you Google hanging groin, you get this picture, which is not a worm. It's hernias, big hernias. The skin is tight. It's not wrinkled. Here's the uh, worms in your skin with an abscess. Here's the hanging groin. The ones on the left are the true onchocerciasis. The one on the right is too tight. It might be a hernia. So the hanging groin is one of the big syndromes. Now your skin gets really itchy. You scratch yourself to death and you get hypopigmented if you're dark skin and your skin gets really dry and wrinkly. And this is scratching, itching from these onchocerca in your skin. Itching, it looks like scabies, but it's not. And then you get hypopigmented from uh, scratching and itching. And uh, that's what it looks like, vitiligo. And there's the worm in the skin. Now, some people say it looks like leprosy because your wrinkles can occur and look like a lion, leonine facies. Although I think that's pushing it too far. This is leprosy, not onchocerciasis. As I said, it's the second leading cause of blindness, onchocerciasis. And that's a sad reality. I visited Benin, Africa, and this guy... Unfortunately, once you're blind, you can't reverse it. He's got blindness from onchocerciasis. Here's people in Africa with onchocerca blind. And there's the hanging groin. And there. And there's a kid leading a blind man in Africa from river blindness. That village is totally vacated because a lot of people were going blind. And there's all the blind people being led in a chain. It's spread by this black fly, Simulium, and it has to breed in rapidly moving water, the larva. That's why you'll see it in white water. So the treatment um, is uh, ivermectin and diethylcarbamazine. 
and it's also found in a milder situation in Central South America, besides Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's called onchocerciasis. In South America, it's called Robles disease and cause blindness. And this is where you see the control programs in Africa. And then this is the control programs in Central South America. And there you have these filaria that we talked about. And there's the head and the tail. And there they are on an ultrasound in a nodule, all those arrows showing the worms. That's how small they are if you scrape the skin. And there they are under the microscope. And there's the blindness from the onchocerciasis. And then we have the trematodes and cestodes. But um, we're out of time, so I will pique your attention and say next time we will cover the flukes and the trematodes or the cestodes. So I wanted you to get a picture of how cool this topic is and um, how you as an infectious disease doctor can actually enjoy um, seeing all these weird things, knowing this stuff and actually knowing what you're doing there. So that I think is pretty cool. So I hope you found this helpful and be glad to do a talk in the near, in the future at any time. Hope you enjoyed a little touch of what medicine is about, and I hope it piqued your interest in medicine. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Green. Um, so thank you again for this incredibly informative session. So we just have a few questions for you. Um, these questions might seem familiar to you because uh, we've asked them before, <laughs> but um, for our new students in the audience, our first question is, what has been the most rewarding part of your career? So the most rewarding part of my career is actually getting to know a person, a patient, person to person, figuring out like a detective what they have, and then you get to know them, develop a relationship with them, a rapport, and then you can actually cure them of something that's been really bothering them. Now that's when they have an acute infection. Some of our patients have chronic infections that they take to the grave and you can follow them over 30 years, however long you work and see them every six months a year and follow them over time and keep them healthy. And you grow old with them and you enjoy the relationship of the physician patient relationship where you're very, um, different relationship from your family, friends. You don't talk about them to other people with their name. You have to be confidential. And, you know, they they trust you. In fact, if you ask, these polls come out every year, what is the most trustworthy profession in the world? And the answer every year is, guess what? Nursing. Guess what number two is? Doctors. However, doctors sometimes get up there and people distrust them when they start talking about stuff and then doctors trust has dropped by five or ten percent because of some bad apples so but we're still real high so that trusting nice relationship is what i enjoy yeah that makes a lot of sense um so our next question is given you wear multiple hats in academia research volunteer work how do you manage your work-life balance yeah that's a great question because um having enough time at home, enjoying your family, you need to uh, disengage from work, can't work all the time, and you just need to discipline yourself that you're going to be present when you're with your family. And yes, you might get a page, but then, you know, you try to get those limited as much as possible. And so um, how to do that? Well, they're doing much better, I will tell you this, than they did in my day. The good old, you know, your grandfather, father, in their day, it was really rough. In your day, they're actually making rules that keep you from having to spend three days in the hospital with no sleep and all those crazy stories you heard. All that's gone. Now there's pr protected hours and there's a whole people who are high hired at hospitals for doctors and students for well-being, taking breaks, giving time to take care of your family. So 
the time now is structurally in place for you to enjoy a medical career and also a family at the same time. So you are very fortunate to be in your generation because in mine, it was real hard, but it's much easier now, but you still have to fight for your time. Right. Yeah. A lot of um, med schools and even like when we're in pre-med, they always try to emphasize, you know, preventing burnout, prioritizing your well-being, stuff like that. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Our next question is, um, can you walk us through a day in your life as in what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, what's neat about me is I've been in practice for 33 years and I didn't even start until all my training was over by the age of 31. So therefore I'm 64 and I don't want to retire because I love it, but I don't want to work hard. So I was able to get weekends off, get rid of my clinic. And now I only work Monday through Friday and I see the patients that I want to see in the leukemia service because I love that area. And um, what's really cool is that I get to teach all the upcoming residents and have them see my patients and students and pre-meds. And I really enjoy that. And uh, that's been really uh, rewarding to look over your career. You work real hard in your uh, younger years and you make your name and you feel comfortable doing what you want to do. And um, even though infectious doctors make less than a internal medicine doctor, even though you have to spend two more years of training be beyond medicine, it's still worth going into because we don't go into it for the money. Yes, you get money. Yes, you will live good. But that's not your main goal. And, you know, unfortunately, um, that becomes part of it. And I would say people like at some places, Moffitt, other places, they actually treat you nicely. They don't just treat you like a big hunk of meat and you're too old to work, get out of here. They actually work with you and try to work a situation that you can work with. So um, I would say there's flexibility. It's not a rigid system where you either work like a dog or you don't work at all. So you can define in time your own perfect niche of your life. Yeah, that's really nice that you get to um, like keep that spark alive of your passion for medicine. Um, yeah, so for our last question, what is some advice you have for students who are interested in pursuing research in infectious disease or just pursuing um, infectious disease as a specialty? Yeah, so um, most of our colleagues are researchers because they're in academics, working at an academic center. And uh, we publish several articles a year in posters at national meetings. And um, the way we do that is called clinical research, where we look at some interesting patients that we've had or a concept, and then we write a paper describing what is unique about it. And then um, you don't really work at a lab. You're not a lab person. There are a few people that actually are MDs and act like a PhD with a lab at the same time. Those are very rare, but it can be done. You can do lab work, but that's not the norm. And if you go in private practice, there's no push for you to publish and do research, but some of them still do it um, just because they enjoy doing it. And it's called clinical research. And um, we have had people from pre-meds to med students of all to residents. And a lot of people coming from other countries want to get into residency after going to medical school in other countries. And they are very motivated to publish because they want to boost their CVs to get into residency programs. And they are pretty well trained in medicine and they know enough to write about it. So you can become a medical writer when you understand medicine and articles. And they do it better the more higher up in the medical training you are. So yes, you can start now pre-med, and then continue through your med school years publishing, and then into your residency fellowship, and then when you're out, keep publishing. Makes sense, yeah. As a pre-med myself, it's really interesting how um, med schools and, like, you know, postgraduate schools in general, they emphasize research because research is, like, the foundation of everything we know today. So that's really awesome that you're so involved in it still. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Green. Those are all the questions we have for you today. Um, again, I'd like to ask everyone to please give a thank you to Dr. Green in the chat box for this fourth, for his fourth amazing session. 
yeah, so I encourage you all to check out Dr. Green's prior three sessions on our YouTube channel because they're all just as insightful as this one. And this one was sort of a to be continued. So hopefully next year, Dr. Green will finish his um, presentation on this topic. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. And if you like an interest in these gross pictures we show you, that's what real life is like, but that's what medicine is. And so we enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. So our certification quiz will be released um, later today. So you'll receive an email once it's published or you can check out our website. And our next telechatting session will be next Saturday, February 24th at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Looking forward to seeing you all there. Thank you so much. Thank you.